I've said it a lot recently, but it's really felt like we've stopped right on the precipice of an amazing new age for animation, adult animation in particular, so close to an incredible new era of variety in cartoons aimed at adults, only to stop just shy thanks to cowardly studio decisions and a lack of foresight. But suddenly, there's a glimmer of hope, and its name is Blue Eye Samurai. I wanted to show people that animation isn't just for kids. Animation isn't just a genre. Animation is a storytelling vehicle as well. There have of course been other incredible adult-aimed series this year that stray outside the typical comedy label, but Blue Eye Samurai seems to be the first one to not only have hit and found success, but also have found studio support in its streaming service Netflix. The show actually already scored a second season pickup after being released a month and a half ago, which is a huge win, especially on Netflix these days. If you aren't familiar, Blue Eye Samurai is an absolutely stunning new adult animated action series set in 1600s Japan. As usual, when I'm trying to get people invested in new series, I'll start this off without going into major spoiler territory, and then I'll warn you before I hit bigger plot points down the line. And trust me, you're gonna want to preserve as many spoilers as you can. I'm not exaggerating when I say this series blew me away. It never stops taking impressive narrative turns. I was rarely ahead of the plot. I figured the show would be violent as an adult-aimed action series, but I didn't expect it to be quite as vulgar or surprisingly horny. There are so many things that I simply cannot show you on YouTube without being demonetized. It's a great show and I'm excited to talk about it. And honestly, if you love the swordplay and action of Blue Eye Samurai, have I got a video game for you. Today's sponsor is the game Wanted Dead, an incredible hack and slash gunfu action games set in a wildly unique cyberpunk world. Honestly, there is so much I love about Wanted Dead. I do not have time for these brawling 100 plus hour RPGs these days. Wanted Dead is a love letter to the games of a couple generations past, the PS3, Xbox 360 era, delivering a focused 8 to 10 hour single player experience. As someone who starts a ton of giant games and does not have time to finish them, this is a massive breath of fresh air. The game has two forms of combat, rapid melee strikes with your katana and pistol, or ranged combat with a variety of firearms, but I think my favorite thing about Wanted Dead is that it's not cyberpunk like you're used to, it's got a bit of a retro wave, late 80s, early 90s aesthetic, really making it stand out. The game also delivers a very tough experience, demanding control, mastery, and adaptive combat. This game really puts your skills to the test, and your skills are rewarded with stylish combat finishers that have over 50 unique finishing animations. The story itself is a ton of fun, and doesn't take itself too seriously, with plenty of pop culture jokes and references. On top of that, there are a bunch of really fun minigames, which I love to see. It feels like games really used to put effort into minigames. And each level ends with a genuinely challenging boss fight, each requiring unique strategies. Click the link in the description to experience Wanted Dead at a 60% discount. This special offer is applicable on PlayStation 4 and 5 until December 20th. Wanted Dead is also available on PC, Xbox Series X and S, and Xbox One. Dive into the action-packed hybrid slasher shooter game today. Blue Eye Samurai is the creative brainchild of husband and wife duo Michael Green and Amber Noyazumi. Green has a substantial resume in TV, film, and comics. He wrote all of the latest Agatha Christie Poirot films by Kenneth Branagh and was even nominated for an Oscar for writing Logan. The couple was inspired to create a story centered around a biracial protagonist set against the backdrop of Japan's famously prejudiced and exclusionary Edo period of history. This was in honor of their own young biracial daughter. Ugh, what cool parents. When I asked mine for an animated series for my birthday, they just made me a Chuck Lorre sitcom. Bazinga. The series follows Mizu, a mixed race samurai with blue eyes, on an initially vague revenge driven path. With the series taking place in the aforementioned Edo period, people like Mizu aren't exactly embraced in Japan. They're actually seen as subhuman. But Mizu's tough childhood has made them incredibly hardened, becoming an unbelievable warrior in their own right. The series primarily follows Mizu's revenge driven path in this wildly violent and deeply unfair period of Japanese history. But one thing that I'm sure you've already noticed about the show, it's freaking gorgeous. I've generally been critical of series that try to do the 3D for 2D look. I often feel the character models and lighting is incredibly jarring, but my god, nearly every frame of Blue Eye Samurai is stunning. When I started thinking about the visuals, I wanted to have an elevated feel to this. 
I wanted this to look like a moving painting. This is just next level stuff. I went in skeptical and came out fully won over. I'm sure this is partially because it isn't entirely 3D, it's a hybrid with some 2D elements, which is why the backgrounds look absolutely unbelievable. But I am genuinely shocked by how great the 3D character models look. That is always the toughest to stylize in a 2D aesthetic, and I think this series does it better than anything I've ever seen. But those backgrounds, let's talk about how stunningly beautiful those backgrounds are. We get chilly, snow-covered forests, depressed, rainy seaport towns, opulent royal cities, all popping off the screen with gorgeous, vibrant color, truly highlighting the country and time period in an elevated way. We took inspiration from Zatoichi and Akira Kurosawa movies. In fact, if you're a Kurosawa fan, you'll love that they even released one of the season's best episodes on YouTube in a gorgeous black and white render. Highly recommend checking that out. The classic samurai film callbacks don't stop at the visuals either. The score is a stunning Eastern inspired masterpiece. Composer Amy Doherty is one of the best working right now. She's done great stuff on some of the current Star Trek shows, and one of my favorite TV scores, the Fargo TV series. That being said, there are a couple of questionable needle drops in the first set of episodes, at least in my opinion. I felt the original compositions were so strong, I really wondered why they were choosing to move away from them in favor of these sort of ill-fitting, more modern songs, but that's a personal preference thing, maybe you'll like them. I think the unsung hero of the series is the fight choreography. They opted to bring in a stunt choreographer named Sunny Sun, who choreographed the fights in real life, then they filmed the references of those fights and animated to those references. But I think most importantly is this choreographer understood the purpose of these action sequence. It wasn't just to be cool, though they are very cool. Sunny and I would talk about story, because it's always story and character first, and how does the story and character support the action. I think when it comes down to it, the production recognized that the details are so important here. Being hyper-specific about every single aspect of this show is why it stands out as something so special. The fight choreography isn't just planned out realistically, it supports the narrative. Action sequences have purpose. They're meant to convey ideas and themes to the audience and reveal truths to the characters. But they even went above and beyond in terms of representing this period of history, making sure that everything was as accurate as possible. We worked with researchers, some who know about architecture of the time and some of whom know the social lives of people at the time. We spoke to one of the world experts on Edo period food. There's just so much care put into this series, from the animation to the research, to the choreography, to the voice acting, to the music, to the writing. There's a reason the series turned out as incredible as it did. It's a show that is moving outside of the conventions we see in this medium. It's doing something unusual in the adult animation space, and it's doing so with sincere care and effort to the point of full-on innovation. Hopefully, we see other studios follow suit and allow this kind of animation moving forward rather than cutting costs and canceling projects mid-production. We have been so close to a general sea change in the industry, with series like Pantheon or this year's Scavenger's Reign, which, yes, I know I need to do a dedicated video about that show. That thing is special. But Blue Eye Samurai appears to be an actual hit, and if you're interested, please go check it out. It is special. Right after this, I'm going to get into spoiler territory, so if you don't want to be spoiled, pause here, go watch the show. It's excellent. And we will dive into the show's story and characters right after this short break. Hey folks, thanks as always for watching the video. If you're a fan of the channel, please check out my Patreon. It's the best way to support me directly, and I've got some big plans for exclusive content, including BoJack episode commentaries. Also, feel free to follow me on social media, particularly Letterboxd, which is the only good social media platform. Thanks. Okay, now that we've talked about the broad strokes of the series, let's get into full spoiler territory. You may have noticed I've been a bit coy about the plot, and that's because the first episode has a major reveal that really informs, well, everything about the show. That big reveal is that Mizu isn't just dealing with the shame of being half-white in Edo-era Japan. Mizu is also concealing the fact that she is a woman. It's a great reveal at the end of the first episode, one I uh, cannot show you because of how they reveal it, but all of these elements inform Mizu's character so well. She is forced to conceal her gender, she also wears tinted glasses to conceal her blue eyes, a giveaway for her lineage, and she's ultimately on a revenge-driven path against her very existence. She's on a revenge quest against four European smugglers, one of which may or may not be the man who fathered her, thereby damning her and her mother to a lifetime of public shunning and even violence from the locals in their village. Your whore mother killed herself because your father is a white 
devil. This setup is so foundational to not only the series, but the character. The social norms of Edo era Japan are so ingrained in even Mizu, who suffers the most at their hand, that her plan is to revenge murder any one of her potential fathers because they are the reason she exists at all. Which also means that the remaining targets could potentially be innocent. Just one of them is the culprit. And this represents how deeply that culture has affected even Mizu's mindset. She also sees these men as subhuman, to be exterminated. And in the instance of season one, the man she's going after is an absolute monster, Elijah Fowler, one of the worst imaginable types of human beings. But I hope that moving forward, the show is going to really challenge Mizu's perception of these people when we meet the other ones, because at some point, Mizu's perception of herself needs to be challenged, and I cannot wait to see it play out. This show has so much narrative and thematic potential. Mizu's childhood was a rough one. After her mother is seemingly killed in a fire, she's taken in by a kindly blind sword maker who teaches her his craft, also while trying to impart unto her important lessons about life and balance. Sword making becomes an allegory for living in Blue Eye Samurai, and we see it reflected in just about everything Mizu does, especially in how she treats her own sword. The core concept being that a great sword must possess both hard and soft qualities, and that Mizu often finds herself imbalanced. There is an incredible scene where Mizu reveals the truth of her heritage to Swordmaster. Pure and impure. You may be something shameful. You may also be strong. And while these lessons resonate with Mizu to a degree, it seems as though she still has work to do to truly understand them, to accept herself. Mizu passes herself off as a man to everyone else she meets in order to sidestep the very unfair and rigid places women had in society at the time. Gender inequality and the treatment of women in this period of Japanese history is a major focus in the narrative. And one of the most fascinating characters this is explored through is Akemi, a coddled princess who is easily the most substantial development of anyone in season one. Early in the the season, she's a spoiled, out-of-touch royal who quickly comes to terms with just how few options a woman in her position actually has. Despite the cushy royal lifestyle, one way or another, she's going to be treated as property, whether it's by her father or her husband-to-be. Running away from home in search of the man she actually loves changes her, being forced to experience the real world and the realities of the era. In doing so, she becomes a more empathetic, understanding person and even forms a deep connection with a group of brothel workers, another group of people who struggle immensely with their lack of options in life. In doing so, Akemi becomes empowered, and by the end of the season, begins to take control of her own destiny, playing everyone who has power over her. There are clearly big things planned for Akemi moving forward. Honestly, nearly every character in Blue Eye Samurai is compelling and nuanced. There's Ringo, a man born with no hands who follows Mizu in hopes of becoming her samurai student, hoping to finally call himself a master of something, anything really. Despite not having the use of his hands, Ringo proves to be very clever and creative building and mastering tools to overcome regular everyday problems. In Mizu, Ringo sees someone who is treated much the same way he is, strangers often thinking of both of them as suffering from some kind of deformity, both being seen as less than human, and this is obviously an inspiration to him. He's following somebody who is so talented and accomplished despite their low social standing. So many of the most joyful moments of the show involve Ringo. There's also Taigen, Mizu's childhood bully turned anime rival, turned unlikely ally, turned maybe even future love interest? Mizu defeats Taigan early on in a samurai duel, and he spends most of the rest of the show chasing after her in an attempt to regain his honor, as he hopes to marry Akemi. And I think thematically, all of these characters tie together incredibly neatly. They're all forced to overcome overwhelming social odds in order to find their place in this culture. Mizu being seen as a demon spawn with her white heritage, Ringo born without hands, Taigan being from a poor family and losing his honor in battle to Mizu, Akemi being forced into the life of a royal wife, that she just doesn't want. Each and every one of these characters has to fight against social norms just to live a life that is fulfilling to them. Blue Eye Samurai also takes great advantage of flashbacks in its narrative. Very early on, it's made clear that we're seeing just a single chapter in the much bigger story of Mizu's life. I mentioned there are four people on her hit list, but we learn that before the show picks up, she's actually already killed one of them. And the continuous reveals of the twists and turns of Mizu's history is easily one of the most compelling aspects of the series. One of the very best episodes focuses on a brief time where Mizu gives up on the idea of revenge, discovering her mother is still alive and attempting to settle down with whatever man will have her. This episode does such an incredible job showing Mizu actually start to believe she can be happy in this traditional role and lifestyle, something she didn't think was possible in this culture, only for reality to set in, ending in tragedy and setting her back 
on her path of vengeance. There is so much to talk about with the series, and I have honestly only really scratched the surface. I definitely want to do some character studies on the main cast at some point. They are truly so well defined already, and there's so much potential moving forward. I cannot wait for season two. And the show is getting major praise from powerhouse creative types like video game legend Hideo Kojima and Spider Verse's Peter Ramsey, who have both sung the show's praises. And not only is the season just incredibly strong, it manages to give us a killer finale, teasing that the show could go anywhere and everywhere, even beyond the borders of Japan. I, for one, cannot wait to see what sort of stories they're going to deliver, especially after such subversive choices in the finale. If the first half of this video didn't convince you to check it out, I hope maybe the second half did. This thing is gas, and the more people that check it out, the better. And while you're at it, check out Scavenger's Reign on HBO. Incredible show. Unbelievable. I need to make a video about it. And also, check out Carol in the End of the World, also on Netflix. There's some really different adult animated series hitting streaming services right now, and I really want everyone to just give them a shot. Hopefully indicative of a bright future. All right, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed. Peace. Johnny! I stay mellow watching Johnny Two Cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny Two Cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move. <laughs>